Thanks everybody for uh, coming to this uh, community engagement session to kick off our winter uh, sessions here uh, about the redevelopment uh, opportunities at the Country Club Road site. Hopefully you've been up here before and uh, it's great to see the cross-country ski meet happening today and the Norwich kids helping for the ice and fire event, uh, event in a couple weeks. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, welcome, and I just want to introduce uh, Stephanie Clark from Whitenburg Real Estate Advisors, um, our lead consultant on this, and she's going to walk you through uh, some of this presentation and then bring in some of our other consultants um, throughout this process. So, Stephanie? Great. Thanks. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back. If you were here in the fall, if we met before, uh, I'm Stephanie Clark with White and Burke. We have also Evelyn Prim, the communications coordinator for the city somewhere around. Will Fraser is here from the city. And then other consultants from the team that are here today, we have Mike Beatty from Black River Design. We have Mark Hamlin and Mike Willard from VHB back there. You'll hear from some of them and they'll be circulating during some of our activity time. Um, so that is uh, some of the te team that's been working on this diligently since the fall. So I just want to get us started um, and talk a little bit about the meeting structure so that you know what to expect. We have two hours, which sounded like a lot of time before we started planning what we wanted to accomplish. But we appreciate you being here today and giving up part of your Saturday to do this. So essentially, I'm going to go through some of the process just to reorient anyone and educate anyone who doesn't know uh, how we've been putting this together, where we're going with this master planning process and recap the piece we just did in the fall and some of those findings. And then we'll hear from VHB about the due diligence and the site analysis that was done and also uh, about the test sketches that we're all here to kind of talk about more today. And then Mike Beatty will be talking a little bit about some of the view sheds and some of the more specific issues to think about as we frame out the whole conversation. We have then a little bit of time to have some questions on the actual due diligence that was just done, anything we presented on. And we're gonna really restrict that time to questions that's, that are going to help clarify things before we get into some of the uh, activities. And then at the, we're gonna do some activities. And then at the end, we're going to have time for folks to have a minute at the mic, there's no mic, but a minute to speak and share some further thoughts that you didn't get out during the activities. So there'll be a few opportunities for input, uh, for out loud contributions. There's gonna be other opportunities to give your input during the activities. So I'll go through what those activities are as we get a little bit closer. But why don't we start um, with talking about process because the process has been very intentional and all of us um, have had this conversation internally about how to do this right and to continue to be transparent as we go. So as you know, the city acquired the property last spring, and that was when the conversation began, the, the input period began. The consultant team was hired in the fall, beginning of fall, and we had a series of meetings and uh, small stakeholder meetings, big meetings, time for input from the community throughout the fall. And concurrently, the due diligence was being done by the VHB team and uh, other specialists to look at the findings of the site itself. We're now in what we're calling the winter stage, which is the time to give feedback about opportunities and constraints, which means we are not looking at concept plans. We are looking at opportunities and constraints and testing what the site can do, as well as talking about the priorities for the uses here. So the intention of this phase is to get direction. We're not making decisions at this point about any concepts. That will be coming next. So we're having a series of public workshops Include, this is the kickoff of all of those workshops. And the last stage will be in the spring, and that will be the concept planning time and feedback to those concept plans. And that will be the chance to vote, um, so more or less, give your vote to the city council who will ultimately, ultimately make, be making the decision. And the end result of this, this whole phase one process is called an actionable master plan, which means that's not even a <coughs> final final development plan, but rather a list of actionable recommendations for next steps, because there will inevitably be more uh, research, more due diligence, more vetting to be done that needs to be done after we come up with this concept that's going to guide the next few steps. What we're very aware of is that time is of the essence. We have 
uh, a housing crisis that's a statewide and national housing crisis that is being felt here in the community. And there's funding available now that may not be available for many years to come. So there's a there's <laughs> pressure to, to act quickly, but we're balancing that with a intentional, transparent, inclusive process. And we've heard lots from the community how important it is to get all the feedback and to take the time to be responsible for this legacy planning. So this winter process it is composed of, a, of several different elements and several different ways of providing input because as we did the research in the fall, we found that a lot of folks were saying they don't have time to come to meetings. Thank you all for taking the time today. And not everybody can or wants to, so we are doing this via public meetings that have a variety of different ways to give input. And I'm telling you this, even though you're already here, because I want you to tell your friends and your neighbors there are lots of ways to plug in. We have a hybrid meeting coming up. We have a virtual, entirely virtual meeting coming up that are going to be following these exact same, this exact same structure. Um, we also have a video. It's a five-minute video running through the, what I'm going to run through today, just condensed. I had to speak a lot faster than I'm speaking right now. And then a survey. And the survey is what we're gonna encourage all of you to, to take and to encourage anyone you know to take because it is going to be our way of really collecting this data and looking for patterns and consensus. And there, we've been distributing flyers, we've been distributing the survey as best we can. So if you can help us with that, we'd be more than appreciative just to be able to make sure everybody's voice is heard and we're hearing from a variety of stakeholders. During the fall, we held a series of public meetings. We had multiple stake, small stakeholder meetings. We distributed information throughout all the different distribution networks. And we received a ton of feedback. And we're, we're prepared to talk a little bit about what that was today. Um, but we also surveyed the business community and surveyed high school students. So some of the, the feedback we heard is going to reflect some of that. This is really a representation of the types of feedback we heard, but I will point you to the main points being the priority, three priorities people identified were environmental sensitivity, housing, and recreation. Those three were the, num the top three priorities for what should this, how this site should be laid out. We heard the top planning concerns being transportation and site access. And we heard that the top procedural concern was a transparent and inclusive process. So with that, I'll ask Mike Willard from VHB to come up and talk through what we found during the due diligence process relative to the natural resources and then also hit on um, the test schedules. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, so. The first part of master planning is typically, you know, this is a very large parcel. Um, and so our environmental scientists went out here and basically took an inventory of what's out here for natural resources. So that's looking at streams, uh, ag soils, uh, wetlands. And so all of those natural resources have sort of constraints associated with them. There's buffers, there's setbacks, uh, there's regulatory uh, process and considerations. And so developing that sort of list of all the natural resources that are on this parcel really sets the framework and understanding where potential development or site improvements could occur if they if they were sort of voted on to sort of move forward so what this map is showing here you can see like this sort of light blue area those are setbacks because there's a stream that runs down through the corridor these sort of bright green areas those were identified as map wetlands and so they have buffers associated with them. Uh, this sort of yellow mass here, that's considered prime ag soil. This upper area up here is sort of considered statewide soils. So again, those all have sort of constraints and considerations for permitting um, as the project sort of moves forward and the vision starts to develop and what can and can't happen here in this site. So, and just to re reinforce, there's a very extensive process sort of mapping out all the inventory that's on this property. Excuse me, where are we in the map? Oh, yeah. uh, yes, orientation. So we are, here's this building here. So we are here, parking lot in the front. Mm -hmm. 
before you move on, I'll just speak to, um, there were other assessments done and this was um, presented at city council as well as it's on the website, uh, but there was also an archeological sensitivity, um, archeological resources assessment and they identified six sensitive areas which were all mostly located um, in the wetland areas or in the wooded areas. So not near the areas where we're looking are the buildable areas. There was also a traffic assessment done, which looked at the intersection and different uh, points of access and capacity. Nothing that surprised us to hear, things that the community had already told us, um, transportation being a key issue, transit being a huge a key issue, the capacity of the intersection will very much, how that gets upgraded will very much depend on what the development plan is. So just flagging some of the areas that will need addressed once we know what is to be developed here. And lastly, an existing building conditions plan was done by BRD for this building we're in now, and that was um, concluded that it is in good shape, um, and there are, but there will still be restrictions about how it could be used and repurposed given the, as you can see here, you know, a lot of um, interior space, so low ratio of, what is it called, wall to, window to window to square footage ratio or something like that and the um, ceiling height restrictions that will that will dictate how it could be repurposed especially for a rec building but those are all online if you have more questions about those after this meeting please feel free to review them and get back to us because we're happy to answer those questions so the next step in the process after the natural resources are mapped is to then evaluate where potential site improvements could occur. So this sort of purple mass down here, this is sort of the low, uh, you know, this is the de developed area where there's parking lot, the existing building is here today. Then as you sort of move up into this part of the site, it's a little bit flatter. Um, so there's considerations about what could be developed there. There's not many steep slopes right in this area. Uh, and then again, so other pods were identified that are sort of in between the different natural resources. And so that sort of starts to set the framework about where site improvements could <laughs> happen on this property. You know, there are considerations, uh, you know, this side sort of on the northwest side, these are, there's some steep slopes over here. There's a ravine <laughs> that's moving through the properties uh, that's predominantly wooded right now. Um, over here on the east side, again, this is predominantly wooded as it is today. Uh, this path that's up here on the top, that was seen as sort of a, a potential sort of like rec trail <laughs> connection on the property and sort of looking at other linkages and how to sort of create connections in the surrounding area back to this land. <coughs> okay. So the test sketches, so these were taking a look at what are the opportunities that the site could actually like support. That's not to say that any of these would ever happen, but it was really saying like, okay, if we wanted all housing here, what would housing look like? If we wanted all recreation here, what would recreation look like? And then there's sort of a hybrid plan. So it's really just exploring what the uses could be, how it could be laid out, and just creating sort of an initial vision. It's really sort of a capacity study to understand what this parcel um, could support. So this plan is what would be considered, we call it a test A. This is like maximum housing. So if your vision was list, put housing here, how many units could this land support? So again, we're down here at this building, uh, because of the, the topography, this is the general flat area, so high density housing was proposed here. So this would be like multifamily housing. It could be three to five stories uh, of housing here. And then as you sort of start moving into the site and going climbing up in grade, the housing starts sort of breaking down in mass. So these orange squares were considered sort of like townhomes. And you can see the roads sort of connecting through again avoiding the natural resources that were identified <coughs> and then as you keep moving up the site this sort of yellow defined areas those were shown as potential single family housing as options so you sort of have higher density residential here then it starts sort of breaking down in scale as you sort of move into the site uh, so this concept i think it was supporting about 513 units of housing on this um, concept. 
Mike, I'd like to add one thing we did during the study was <laughs> to start from somewhere, we tried to utilize existing stream crossings. So we didn't just say, hey, let's just put roads here. We tried to find something to help guide a discussion. So that was just kind of a starting point. So there was, that was hey, there's a path there now that's probably more easily turned into a road. Let's let that sort of dictate something. Yeah, so again, it was just, it was all based on avoiding disturbance of the natural resources. Is that the red line or? It, uh, yeah, so the, the parcel boundary is this yellow line, and then that red line is basically on top of it. Oh. <laughs> Maybe we can shut off these big lights so I can see that. And these will be, so let me clarify too, in, there's going to be four stations that we're going to send you to in the second, um, in one of the activities, in the first activity. So you'll have a chance to, to zoom in up close, stand in front of them and actually look at them a little closer too. Um, we understand the clarity on this. It's hard with a room up so big and it's <coughs> one, of the, one of the limitations of an in-person meeting. But when we get into the smaller rooms, you'll get a closer, closer view. Okay, so this was, again, this was the max housing. How much housing could this parcel support? This idea was just, it remains all recreation. So this was looking at what are the opportunities for site improvements that were specifically targeted um, to outdoor recreation. So again, we're down here by the building. You can see some more formalized parking was sort of mapped out. Um, some additional uh, recreation facilities here, some buildings, outdoor pool, and then you can see some really sort of defined outdoor recreation, you know, courts and fields were sort of mapped out. And then taking the rest of the parcel and just having it be sort of passive recreation, whatever it could be, trails, uh, bike, you know, connections, cross-country skiing. <laughs> so basically, by and large, the rest of the site was seen as undeveloped for the most part. So the density and the site improvements, again, were focused where the, the terrain is favorable. So these are the, the flatter parts of the site where you could do larger ball fields, and that's where they would be supported. So this plan is sort of the hybrid. It's sort of combining the two ideas, having housing and recreation on the site. So again, sort of improved recreation facilities here around the existing building, uh, some new ball fields added, some high density housing here. So these would be multi-story buildings, could be three stories, possibly five stories. And then again, moving up into sort of townhomes up in this section, and then sort of small pod of single family residents. And then by large, leaving the sort of the eastern and western sides of the site undeveloped for trails and connections and uh, paths to be sort of explored. Great, thank you. Um, How much think, housing is in that view? Um, that one, um, yeah, 173 or 240, depending on if you go three story or five story in some of those multifamily. Um, the so one of the things I wanted to mention is that when we had the fall sessions, we heard a lot of feedback about a lot of different elements. These are not exhaustive plans. These do not incorporate all those elements. We know those elements are important. And we're starting here with these most land intensive uses to start. And then we know when we want to incorporate other pieces, what, connecting wildlife corridors, for example, looking at ways to incorporate solar, um, various pieces that need to be addressed, but that has to happen in a, there's a sequence here. But we did hear, you know, some things that could be shown early on and that were important to show early on, like the connection of the U32 trail, that red line, and also um, what Mike is gonna speak to about, uh, about <coughs> view sheds. And that's important to consider at this stage. So we had to make some judgment calls about which, which stage these would be evaluated. One thing I wanted to mention as well is that in the max housing option, and even in any of the options, the buffers for the streams and the wetlands, those are, you can do, you can still walk in those areas. <laughs> you know, those are not restricted. So when you talk about max housing, it's not like it's gonna be pavement everywhere. There's still those setbacks. Um, not that you know, I'm advocating for that, but pointing that there are different um, elements of light rec to more intensive rec or, or just usage, land usage as um, 
our human impact on these areas. We wouldn't be able to program anything in those areas and it would need to be light impact, but um, there is that within Max housing and in this C can test you, sketch C. Can you explain uh, where the roads are here and uh, parking for the housing that's to the north, the orange blocks? Um, so roads, all the roads here in the, in the dark gray and parking for, for units like that. I believe the assumption was underground parking. Is that the assumption? The or, what's that? Right in the unit. Right in the unit. Parking within the unit, yeah. Um, and we're gonna have, uh, I can take one more question. We're gonna have more time for Q&A before we get into more, but yeah. I'm wondering about additional um, entrance and exit to this parcel. Yeah. Is that gonna be the only one? Is there a possibility? Right, we, we do have, and again, sorry, you can't see that from where you're sitting at all, but when you get closer, you can see there are some um, identified points here and here of how could we maybe explore connecting to abutting properties that that would need to be considered as well, absolutely. Um, we don't know where those would be depending on the land plan and then it would have to be conversations with the butters to see what's feasible. All right, let's, um, let's move on and then we'll come back for more questions when we're done, but Mike can speak to some view shed. Sure. <clears throat> I don't know if people have had a chance to visit the site very often, but this is quite a great piece of property. Um, you know, a south facing hillside that stretches along a, kind of a large uh, ridge area where once you get up towards the back of the site, um, it's probably the northeast corner considered here at the top of the hill, you have some really great views to the east over towards uh, Camel's Hump. And uh, what we did, we, we sort of took a, a walk along this property line, along the tree line there, and sort of scouted out how far can you see, how far can you go as you still get a very beautiful view out towards the mountain there. And it's a pretty expansive view from the northeast side where that yellow line represents where you can see the mountain profile out in the background. Now, it's not to say you lose all views from everywhere once you're past that, it's just that is the specific mountain. Here. Um, the blue area here represents the southern view corridor. Um, a lot of a great exposure. Uh, I believe that's the old fourth or fifth hole on the back side there where it's, it, it, there's just a great view to the south from, from that elevation. Um, given, the, given the flatness of the lower side here and the increasing hillside, there's really uh, there's views back to the uh, southeast, the northwest. It's, it's just a really a great spot. So this was something we surveyed as we tried to, to help influence just our generic discussions about where you can see. I mean, it, it's not to say that when you're way out on the old 7th, uh, 6th uh, or 7th green, that you really do have nice views everywhere here. But I think when in terms of, when we're talking about open spaces and the expansive views, um, these are sort of the ones uh, we felt that people would feel uh, they would want to see. And you see we included some photos. It wasn't the greatest day when the photos were shot, but there was snow on the ground. So we, we went for it. Uh, the next slide here um, could be a little confusing, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. This is a small plan of uh, the same orientation as we were looking at on the other plans, on the other drawings. Um, what we did was we tried to show what the scale of the site would be if one were to take a, a knife, cut it right in half, and give uh, relationships to, to different pieces. Uh, so we, we turn it here. You can see the existing building in white uh, in this area here. Same thing there. The white square is the existing building we're in now. Um, the bottom corner of the site here represents Route 2. So you can see just how much elevation we gain to the back of the site. The red lines on each of those sections represent the property line at the top. Uh, of the hillside here. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. And um, again, these forms were just something we, we, we were presenting as trying to, to meet the square footages that were discussed in the other, uh, on the other sheets. So um, it's a little hard to see. I mean, you can see that there's a lot of elevation gain from front to back, and as we did a blow up on the top of the page, um, it's hard to see at this scale. What you'll be able to see on the page is that um, you can see some, right in the front here, you know, some vehicles, uh, some people up on the upper trail, assuming you were to put the uh, connection trail up there. So really to demonstrate that we will still have views over the top of structures uh, as you traverse the, the north side of the site. Yep. Um, so we did two sections here, thank you. So this one is cut through um, some of the uh, uh, townhouse residential per se and then the larger um, multi-families with the green space in the front, which is uh, sort of this area down here. Um, the, next the next section here, the white 
square still represents the existing building. We're showing a larger scaled uh, purple building to represent uh, a recreation or community building, which requires more volume just to, uh, to meet the needs of the activities that will be proposed there. And you can still see as the, as the grading changes along the backside of the hill, um, you can see just different forms where the people up on the top of the hill there, they may, there may be some rooftops in the way, but this was <coughs> just an assumption of the existing grading. There wasn't a lot of thought given to, well, if we bury this house a little bit, bury these buildings a little further, you get better views. Um, that's sort of part of the next study, but it shows that there are opportunities to really have expansive views from the north side of the site uh, because it is the high area. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, so we will have, these are on the website, and I know that that's a lot to absorb, and it's something you probably want to see a little bit more in, uh, up close. We'll leave this particular plan up on the projector when there's the free time to move around, so that if you want to get a closer look, because those are not printed up on the walls. But that just gives you a sense of the scale and massing that we're talking about. So the, um, the last piece that I want to present on before we get into the activities and some Q&A is we are not at any stage, because these are not concepts, this is not a time to talk about costs per se, but I wanted to give you a sense of just the, the order of magnitude and the scale. So from a cost perspective to the city, so what would the city be responsible for? For infrastructure, which includes roads, buildings, parking areas, fields, when we look at max housing, that's gonna have the lowest cost for the city. It's mostly roads and then the developer, whoever the developer would be, because you put this out to an RFP to have someone else, the city would not be responsible for building housing, would be building the, the rest of the infrastructure, the rest of the development. For max recreation, the city would have more cost that would be the buildings themselves in these case in these tests we've shown about 60,000 square feet of building so that's a lot of building that's a lot of cost and in the rec scenario there would also be the construction of the fields construction of the parking and public parking and in the balanced we're calling it the the hybrid of housing and rec that's going to have the highest cost because we're still accommodating a 60,000 we're still putting a 60,000 square foot building on it and doing all the supportive public parking, but also doing roads out to some of those uh, housing parcels. But what we need to take into consideration is the revenue side, which is that in both max housing and the balance <laughs> test A test C, those some of those parcels would then go back on the would be taxable again. And those would start generating tax revenue, which would offset the cost of the infrastructure. So what you see is if you were just looking at, at cost, it looks like the most expensive is to do the balanced. But when you factor in a return on the taxable value, you see that switched. So it now would be the lowest cost would be to do max housing. The highest would be to do max rec. And in the middle would be now this does not give a scale in terms of how close is this to this, you know, in terms of, you know, what are we talking here? Are we talking a million dollars and $10 million? Are we talking, that's a much harder question to answer when we're talking at this general scale. But what that, just to put that basic concept, because most people don't spend their days building infrastructure. So I thought this would be helpful just to be an educational point to keep in mind as we go forward, you're going to be thinking about that as an ultimate, this is not happening in a vacuum, it would have to be paid for. This also doesn't take into consideration the funding sources. There will be funding sources available if we do housing here versus if we do rec, different housing, different funding sources available. So this is not a complete picture, but a little bit of a data point. And there was one question yeah. here. <clears throat> when you say roads, does that include water, sewer, power? Yeah, it could be utilities as well as roads, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yes. Thank you for, for asking. So what I want to do from here is to walk you through what the rest of this um, session is going to look like in terms of the activities. And then we're going to take questions. So I think we can pull the lights up, Josh, if that would be OK. Um, so what we're going to be doing is three different activities, if we have time. <laughs> so the question we have for everybody here today is now knowing the site limitations, which is something we didn't know in the fall, 
and knowing the community's identified needs, because we've been widely publishing what people had been saying over the course of the fall. You've probably heard it being in the community. Knowing what you know now, how would you lay out the site? What's your vision and what would you want the what do you want the planning team to know as we go into the concept planning phase? So what we're gonna do is ask after the questions, after we take some questions just to get clarification on anything we've presented, is we're gonna ask people to split up into four groups. They're identical stations, so no, no better station than others, just a matter of proximity. We have two in this room and two in other rooms. And what you're gonna do is based on the test sketches, there's test sketch plans up on the wall and a buildable areas map on the wall, you're gonna get eight dots. And there are eight areas on that buildable areas plan that we showed you. So the buildable areas and the natural areas. And for each buildable area, you're gonna assign a dot for what use you want it to be, you would vision it to be. And so there are rows on the chart that show multifamily housing, single family housing, outdoor recreation, conser conservation for Abnaki um, representation, Abnaki use. There's solar arrays, all the different uses, and then an other category for people to, to specify what other might mean. So we'd ask that you take us, we're gonna give you a sheet, there'll be someone at each station, you get a sheet of eight stickers, and after you've had a moment to absorb the plans, put a sticker in each column for what you think that build, that particular area should look like. After we're done with that exercise, which may take a little while and we recognize there's logistical challenges as there would inevitably be, we're gonna come back here and we're gonna do what's called one, two, four, which is a chance to talk amongst yourselves about what's important. Again, answering this question and answering the question, you know, what, what strikes you as the most important thing that the planning team should know? So one, you're gonna take one minute to think about the question to yourself. Two, you're gonna to turn to a buddy and in pairs, you're gonna talk for two minutes each. And then you're gonna take two pairs are gonna create a quad and you'll have eight minutes as a quad to discuss. And from that quad, we're gonna be distributing index cards for folks to write down their suggestions. So when you come back from the stations, if you'd situate yourself in a place that's comfortable to be able to talk to your neighbors it would be very helpful because we'd like to then have those index cards come back to us with these thoughts that come from your group discussion, which may yield something different than what you came into the room <laughs> thinking today because we're hoping that this is an evolution this is an entirely iterative process. And with our time remaining after that, we'll have everybody um, raise their hands as, as we'll call on folks for a minute at the mic. We don't have a mic, but a minute to speak um, and say anything remaining that you didn't get to get out on the paper on an index card. And that will take us entirely till noon. So in the interest of time, we're gonna take about 10 minutes or so for questions Again, keeping in mind, this is not a chance to vocalize an opinion. Let's hold that for the end and, and for these exercises. But if you have questions that would help you in those exercises, we'd love to hear them and clarify them now. All right, I'm gonna start here and then go to the back. Uh, I am one of the individuals who has spent quite a bit of time studying this, including um, I've walked the entire site and prepared a, a statement that takes about four minutes, I would say, which I would like for the entire group to listen to as well as you. And I'm thinking there are undoubtedly other people who have done something similar and wonder if we will get out the community for uh, those of us who have that kind of thing. I'm not sure there will be enough time for folks to give that much feedback at, at, for everyone to hear. But we'd be happy to hear your comments as a team, as the planning team. We can, we're, we'll be sticking around after the meeting and can hear all of that. If we have time and there's there's extra time, we absolutely can open it up to that. Um, we one in the back here, and then I saw it over there. Hi, thank you. I'm curious. Um, up in Burlington, for Best Buy and that whole area is, and there's been a lot of housing. Uh, looks like apartment housing built back in there. Is that what you're envisioning for a lot of housing? 
I'm going to ask either Mike or Mark to speak to that. I mean, that is multifamily housing. Yeah. And right. the high, the, the concept sketch had the sort of the higher density. <laughs> that would be the multifamily housing, like three to five stories, similar to what you see at the yeah. crossings. Are those three or five up there? I'm sorry. There are mostly three. Mostly mm -hmm. three. That's a good question in terms of scale. Yeah. I do think we have a question like about that, like that on the survey um, that talks about massing to kind of help visualize because there's some images there that you can respond to because it is hard to imagine. <laughs> but it's wonderful to go up everybody and look and see what's up there now. Sure, sure. Because you'll really get a great idea of what um, they've done. True. I'm going to go over here and then to. Um, I just uh, wanted to comment on the. Uh, the slide that said no uh, revenue from if, with all recreation because recreation facilities do actually generate yeah. many kinds of revenue. Yeah. Um, so my question is, did you take that into account? But also perhaps my re request is to look at that more carefully because uh, how does it scale with respect to property taxes? It's, it's a great point. Um, this that was purely taxable revenue. So it did not take into account operational revenue that would be a piece if the if the property were, you know, being used as a community facility with operating different users. If it was being subdivided as you know a piece that gets sold to a private entity to do a piece that's private rep, for example, then that would become taxable revenue. That's not what test B showed. But you're absolutely right that there are other sources of revenue that we will consider when we get to the bigger picture. Um, into dial actually less of a big picture dialing in more specifically on some concepts because you're right any kind of revenue stream should be considered as much as a grant would be considered as much as taxable revenue but the piece the reason I we focused on the taxable piece only at this time is because it's the only thing right now the tech that the city could count on that the city is in control of in this kind of land planning at this scale there's a ton more variables that would go into whether or not the city could, um, you know, what at what scale would you be doing operational revenue? There's a ton of different options. You could have an entire wing that's being, you know, rented out or, or used for different types of revenue or just one small space. Um, we're gonna go right here and then into that. Um, my concern is timing. I mean, it could be done in stages, so that the, the, the money would have to be figured into that, and, and that would be something very hard to make decisions on when you're just putting points on the map. That's a fair, fair point. Yeah, we don't, know, we don't know exactly how the timing is going to go with this in terms of phasing out, um, and that's somewhat going to be dictated you know, we can't prescribe how the public input is going to shape this process. Because housing might be the most important right now for taxes, but, you know, that's yeah. just about Yeah, that. that's fair. Um, I think we said you go back here and then here. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate over here that, that I found that, that value about the taxes thing kind of misleading, you know, and not including all the costs of putting that in and, you know, and the cost of having sprawl. And I've gone up to Williston to see what, you know, those places look like. And they almost look like community deserts. <laughs> you know, you don't see people out there doing things. It, it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have a nice feel to it. And, um, you know, you look out here and, and recreation adds so much to the community. And I really feel like that was not emphasized at all in that particular, in that particular Did, did you have a specific question relative to these slides? Uh, no, I just wanted to note that it was, it was, it, I felt that it was misleading. Noted. And we're going to go here and then to purple over right here. So, so I listened to Josh Jerome's interview on the uh, that was on the website, and one of the things that really struck me, surprised me a lot, was that the average household size in Montpelier is 1.9 people, which means there's a huge amount of people living individually. So my question is, how did the occupancy of so many individuals living factor into how you decided how many uh, housing units to do? Um, that's a good question. I would say, you know, it, the tests, specifically the, the housing tests, um, were informed in two different ways. One is 
in a bubble, like in a vacuum. What could the site support? And doing a representational exercise to show the varying product types. Because what we heard a majority of the feedback actually, which may be slightly contrary to the data, is the different price points, many different price points, and different options, not just um, single family and not just multi family. So showing a variety so that there's a, a mix of people living on the site. So that was kind of one way of shaping a content that informed that sketch. The other that informed the sketch is to, is to highlight how specifically how the different sizes could look on this site. I mean, you can do pretty much anything still. You could move the multifamily housing up on the ridge. You could put the single family down below. You can make it all multifamily. And that's exactly what this stage is for. We want to hear, do people have part of the reason for locating the multifamily at the bottom is so that you reduce the number of trips that are going up through the site. You know, as you get further up, if there's only single family up there, you see fewer cars going all the way through the site. Same with recreation. Um, but if the community felt strongly that really multifamily should have the benefit of the views, that's where this is going and the city council agrees. Then, so it's, a, it's an iterative process. We, we chose this to start as a representation. Well, and I just think that one of the questions we want to hold going forward is there's a huge demand for not even single family, but single person yeah. housing. <laughs> yeah. So, like, call yeah, the data. Out. The data is there, out. for sure. Um, so, I think, what did I say after? <laughs> sorry. I said right here. I'm sorry. Thank you. And then I saw a pin in the back. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, I was recently on the planning commission. And one of my concerns about this site in general is how does this fit into the master plan? Mm -hmm. And how about access back to the city? I mean, you're, the plans are still showing a single access onto the site. And I don't really see that there's any connection back to the city right. itself. And so I'm concerned yeah. this is just going to become a suburb. The second question I can answer, but the first question is going to go back to Josh. Um, for second piece being, we haven't addressed transportation here. As I said earlier, we, we know that's something that would absolutely be critical to that's going to be critical in the next phase is how does it get connected and is it you know maybe through one of those other access points as well um you know different factors we have to consider uh, but we haven't had it we don't know what the demand is here. we don't know what the intensity is so that will drive how many trips are here what types of users but to to your question about master planning that's out of my realm josh do you want to speak to that yeah, I mean, I would, I would say it does come back down to the transportation. We're still trying to um, determine um, how many units can be up here with just one way access. Um, so that's why we are exploring other um, avenues going up to Town Hill Road and through Savings Pasture. Um, you know, the intention was for this not to be a satellite of the downtown. We want it to be connected to the downtown. Um, and I think the um, that it will be in some degree, whether that is pedestrian, bicycle, um, uh, infrastructure to connect, um, and hopefully vehicular also. So yes, questions so that we're, yes, questions that we're all still trying to, to answer. Um, we're gonna take two, two more questions because we're running out of time at this stage. We have time at the end to contribute, again, thinking, contributing opinions and your, and your perspective. Um, will come in the next three exercises. We really want to hone in on answering any questions that might help you get a better sense of how to participate. So in the back there, and then um, you have your hand up for a long time. Okay. Sure, point of clarification about the areas that are being kind of kind of external developers to develop. Um, yeah. Would those be actually subdivided and sold to them, or did you hand it to the city? Like, what's the plan for the property? Good question. Um, mostly, if it's going to be private development, it's going to be housing development specifically, we would recommend, the planning team would recommend subdivision. If it's if it's going to be city use, more likely not. Um, we'll go that question. And there's one more here. Yeah. This is getting back to transportation. I'm curious about the impacts to the intersection and necessary changes to the access road. You alluded to having done some work on that. Yeah. I'd be curious to know if that work is going to be available as we do this work, and give us a, a sense of magnitude of yeah. costs associated with max, medium, and no residential right. um, Good question, and I'm able to answer most of it. Uh, there is a there is a study on on the website that's the transportation study um, or tra transportation assessment, and it did look at that intersection, and I think the threshold was 70, 75 or so units um, around that that starts to trip major 
improvements needed at that intersection. So there is a threshold at which number of units on the site is going to trigger major improvements, which leads to major costs or higher costs. What those costs are is the part of the question I can't answer yet, because again, if we're talking 70 new units or we're talking 500 units, that's very different. Um, but as your point is well taken, that that's something we need to dial in a little closer on the concept plans. Again, if we're talking, we'll have a better sense of the scale and the impact. And once you know impact, you can start to assess the, the costs associated. Um, so we're gonna go here, and then we had time for one more, so I'm gonna grab yours. Oh, um, I was curious how our responses over the next in the next three um, yeah. activities will be sort of analyzed and incorporated into this process, and yeah. and and also how it might relate to the feedback you get from a private developer. Obviously, they're mm -hmm. going to have a lot of yeah. input on sort of the final design and yeah. what they want to do or can do. Yeah. Um, so, good, good question. Um, so. The process piece is uh, is very important. We by the end of the week of the I think it's February seventeenth is when the poll is closing. The the survey is closing, and we'll have done all of our stakeholder meetings and public meetings. Um, after that, we as a team will be going through all of the data, trying to understand where those patterns are, what's rising to the surface, where are some creative ideas, and discussing them as a team. And that will coalesce into some recommendations. Then we have a meeting with city council at the end of March to talk about the recommendations and the findings. And that's gonna guide putting together the concept plans that are coming forth in the spring. So there's a few different stages of, of assessment and analysis, and that will be recapped out to the public you know, in, a, in a document and back to the council. And then your ask about the developer is a good one. You know, with the housing, there's a little bit here of what the city can ask for and, and request and di dictate in terms of what they want, but there's also market realities of what's feasible and what's not feasible. And so what our recommendation will be is to show the areas where the housing is wanted, if there's housing wanted at the end of this process, and there can be recommendations in there in the RFP that goes out to propose to developers you know, X percentage affordable or must include affordable housing. And let the development community come forward with proposals because that's gonna very much depend on cost. It's gonna very much depend on what the city can do to help in terms of funding. You know, if we were to um, reapply to get a TIF district extended out this way, that could very much affect how much funding we can use and for infrastructure. Um, and so there's gonna be a back and forth a little bit, but the city, by being in control of the parcel, has input on how the, the, the direction it will go. But then it'll be a matter of seeing what's proposed and they can propose something that the city didn't ask for. And it may be more creative and it may be more in line with what we'd heard during the process. So then the city council could say, actually this really resonates, this is very creative and is getting at what we needed it to be. So there's a little bit of um, back and forth and it's how public-private partnerships work and actually is the beauty of a public-private partnership because the private sector has strengths that we don't as the public sector and vice versa. And the public sector can bring resources to bear that the private sector can't. I hope that answered your question. Okay, we're gonna need to put a pin in any further questions. We can get back to anything else that needs to be said after our exercise. But now it's chance to move your bodies so we have four stations. Raise your hand if you're a station leader. Okay, so follow a station leader. There's two in this room and two in other rooms. Identical stations, and we'll meet back here at 11.20. All right, we're gonna call everybody back to their seats and um, do a tiny bit of a tiny bit of recap here. Um, but we're also gonna put this to a, a little bit of a group vote on how we proceed because it's now 11.20. Um, firstly, lessons learned for the planning team. Bigger dots, we hear you. Now, we, to be fair, we expected twice this turnout based on the RSVPs, and we didn't think there'd be enough room. Oh, sorry, my audio, sorry about that. We, we thought there would be twice as many uh, and not enough space in each box, so that's one thing. Not yellow dots, we had someone go back over there with, with pen. And to reiterate, it should have been, and I'm sorry if you didn't get this um, from the onset, but we will clarify again for our future sessions, 
one dot per column so that it was what use per area of the site. But we will be um, under taking that into effect, into account. Uh, when we, we, well, we, we tried, and each, each group wasn't sure exactly when, uh, when they started. So we will take that into consideration as we evaluate this. But you can kind of see, based on these four charts, where people are starting to, to put, their, put their feedback. So with our remaining time, we have a little over <laughs> a half hour, we could do our planned breakout groups where you are talking amongst yourselves. We did notice a lot of that was happening during the time at the stations, which is great. So maybe it's not necessary and we can just open it up this entire remaining time for, for everyone to have a chance to speak. Raise your hand if you're in favor of the latter, of the second option. Oh, okay. all right, done. So we'll call it minute at the mic. We don't have a mic and it may be longer than a minute, but um, best laid plans, we're iterating. We would like to ask you to, um, to raise your hand. We will do our best to try to strategically, as I did with the questions, um, try to get to everybody and tell you if you're on deck. Um, if I am going to ask you to keep your comments restricted to a minute, if possible, so we give everybody a chance. There's more than 35 people here, and there's 35 minutes remaining. We want to give everybody a chance. I'll donate to... my minute to the gentleman who has the written. Okay, thing. okay, that's very kind. So we would like to say, you know, use the time wisely and and try to keep your comments um, brief. But this is also not your only time for input. Remember that we are available by email. We are available by, um, you can call Josh. And then the survey is a great place to also download a lot of these thoughts. And when we recap this from the fall, like we did with the fall, we're going to be recapping the public input for the purposes of and presenting that at the end of this stage and presenting it to the council in March so that the community will hear what was said by each other as well as what they contributed individually you contributed this is a quick Can process a more q a before we get into the voicing our opinion that makes a lot of sense yes if there's some questions first off the top um we can answer some questions and then get into some comments i think that that does sound good if there are any remaining questions people especially didn't get answered from the first time another process question mm -hmm. uh question What's that? A question about. Uh, okay. Oh, did you have a question first? Well, let's, he raised yeah, his hand I know first. There's a lot of interest, uh, I think, on their all three plans uh, for daycare mm -hmm. or preschool. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've gotten into that level of specificity yet. But, uh, Right. If so, where are you thinking that would be site? Right. Um, we have not gotten into that programming specificity. That would be part of, uh, I'm, that has come up, um, and it came up in a couple conversations, I think, as an other use. Um, when we talked about it with um, a few folks, they were talking about a community center, which would be bigger than a rec piece, and that would most likely be where your most likely daycare use would be. But if there was a desire to put day, locate daycare within one of the multifamily buildings, we just haven't gotten to that level of specificity. And you're aware there's already a preschool in this building. Correct, yeah. We talked to the center director here somewhere. So another question here. You mentioned solar here. Mm -hmm. is, is that site, cited on the land or on the roofs? Or? Well, a solar array would, would is referencing a field, an actual siting. That's not to talk about what kind of solar you could do on a building. Right. That was just that question. Thank you. Um, is there another question in the back? Yeah, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but yeah, um, it, the, the point about daycare um, uh, just has um, speaks to my, my concern that, that not, not enough kind of attention is given to the concept of a, a more of a self contained community that has shopping and has other kind of uh, mixed uses that will kind of minimize the flow of traffic uh, into and outside of, uh, of the area. And I guess my question would be, uh, has that been uh, given consideration? Right. Um, and that, that comment has come up a few times, and we're, we're well aware that is, a, um, is the desire of a lot of people, not necessarily a unanimous decision or anything, but absolutely people have said how because the very nature of this site being out of the downtown, there are services that may be needed here. There are maybe uses that need to be accommodated. 
but that level of programming and that level of um, detail hasn't is going to be dictated by this process yes. where we're talking about that balance and that massing. So I think if we're getting into comments, I think we're kind of getting at questions and comments are going together. Is that a question? I have a question. Okay, we'll do one more question and we'll come back to you in the back. Usually each city, sort of from the state, there is a number of housing that's needed, housing needs, and that usually there's a number associated with that. Because, I mean, what's the housing need in Montpelier in uh, terms of building this and the other we, things? We need a little bit of everything. I know. But I mean, I think I think this past this past week, when my housing finance agency came out with a report for how many units of housing the state needs by twenty thirty, I think it was around forty five thousand. So simple basis, if you do it on a per capita level, uh, and, and and what does Montpelier need? It needs quite a quite a bit more units of housing, and that is going to be a mix of. Uh, multifamily, triplexes, duplexes, maybe even, even single family. So I think we don't have good census data because we're still using uh, ACS, American Community Survey data, mm -hmm. the 2020 decennial data, which is much more accurate, is going to be coming out this May. So once that's available, then we can start to look at, from that data set, and try to identify actual numbers of units for particular products of housing. Um, we're going to go back there, and then we'll go to the next person who raises their hand. I know that a lot of the things here that we propose are going to be associated with the housing and the development. It's like kind of long, long term. Mm -hmm. And these buildings, um, when buildings aren't used or people aren't living in them and keeping them heated and keeping them up, they tend to go downhill. So I'm wondering if these buildings um, can be used in the interim. I know that the hub has tried to do a lot of, have, has made a lot of proposals about trying to use these in the interim between this and the long-term planning. And I'm wondering if these buildings could be used for recreation, for the community. I guess there is a, um, uh, the, the thing for the children. Do you have a plan for that? The short term, do you want to speak to that? Well, I mean, we do have two tenants in the building now that use space, uh, but then also the community services department uh, is analyzing uh, existing space to see what they can use for their programming, um, specifically this, this room uh, and possibly this room over here. Um, so that is being considered. Um, so I would imagine that some of this will be utilized by the community services department. Yeah. Um, again, I'm wondering why reluctance to work with a group that wanted to do projects here right now, the hub, became so difficult when they were ready to go with recreational facilities, some commercial activity that would really put some life into this pro this area today. But yeah. Well, city council voted not to. Okay. As a city council question, right? Bill. Bill. Yeah, I can answer that. Um, we had active conversations with the hub, and I know there's representatives here about uh, how it work together. And once it was decided that the city was going to purchase the property. I think there was concern about immediately turning over a, a portion of it to a group without any sort of public process or input about what publicly owned land would um, be used for. And so we are, this is the process that we committed to the hub that we would follow. And we are doing that. We did, the council did vote to uh, negotiate a lease with them. We weren't able to reach an agreement that worked for both parties, and that's fair. And, uh, they, are, I think, are one of the stakeholders that are going to be spoken with as part of this process. And as we develop recreation options, if that is where the public wants to go, I presume that, they, that what they're proposing would be considered. But um, that's, you know, I think, I think that the city council felt that uh, just turning over a large portion of this property to a group, and when I say a private group, I know they're a nonprofit and, and all that. But, private group that is going to develop it without the rest of the community having to say wasn't the right thing to do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll take more. If you want to raise your hand, I can go from you and then to you back um, I, I appreciate the process that you're going through. I think it's well constructed and I appreciate your presentation today. 
um, saying that I know that there will be things that end up here that I'm not happy with. <laughs> and I would invite all of you to recognize that for yourselves as well, that it's compromise. And I think we can come up with an amazing uh, development plan for this property. Uh, that said, I'm really in favor of multi-housing uh, that, uh, that is, creates a community. I'm not in favor of single family housing, just my take on it. I'd love to minimize the uh, impact of automobiles on this place. I think there's lots of creative ways we can do that if we think about where we want to be in 50 years. Because that's where, I've lived in Montpelier for 50 years now. And I know that that is going to happen here too, to somebody. Um, I think that it's a remarkable site. I'm thrilled that we bought it and that we have some control over how it's going to be developed. Uh, no, not everybody will be happy comment, which is what I've been telling myself since August. Thank you. We'll go back here. Yeah. Uh, to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have to agree. This is a beautiful property and a wonderful opportunity. I also agree. I'd love to see a lot of multifamily housing up here. We have to build that housing in all the buildings here for the century that we're in. It has to be net zero. We have to really think about energy systems. Um, possibly networks geothermal, solar on the roofs, um, really, really tight buildings. Ditto. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Who's next? We've got you here, and then we'll come up to the mm -hmm. I do better. I do better with open space. space. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but that is not to say that I don't support housing. I do support housing, but I want us to remember that this area has been used for active recreation for decades and, and for socializing in this space. Um, and I'm advocating for the use of this rolling open space to be designed for active use by our community to encourage all season recreation outside, designed around cross-country skiing for all skill levels from beginners to school teams to senior citizens. These same spaces can be designed for biking, sweaters, walking, and other activities with flatter areas made appealing for strollers, wheelchairs, and other devices. <clears throat> Let's keep the beauty of this property with all its well-planted trees. Roads should be designed around active recreation to avoid collisions and interruptions, to provide access to housing for all income levels with as much passive solar design uh, as economically feasible, and community spaces with outdoor orientation. More structured indoor and outdoor recreation and public transportation can be designed to fit around active outdoor spaces to make this resource available to the city as a whole. Solar array arrays should be primarily on rooftops, buildings, outdoor resting places, put things under the solar. Let's envision a place that invites our whole community to be as active and as we are able and helps us to remain so, both for our physical and mental health. Let's invite the creation of housing for a range of income and household sizes and ages. Let's make it easy for residents, both here and from the community, to get outside, to connect for healthy living, and to connect inside when outside is not as appealing. Let's keep space for daycare and make space for after school and summer activity. Let's make this place with a history of outdoor recreation, inviting uh, inviting the people from all over town and their broader area to create, uh, to recreate outdoors and indoors and to continue to create community. Oh, I meant to take my mask off, but I hope you could hear me. Let's enlist designers of outdoor spaces and of housing and of recreation that will be treasured by future generations and preserves and takes advantage of its beauty. Um, 
go right here and then Jody, did you want to? Uh, it's Jody. Yes. Did you want to volunteer your time to him? I can. If you'd like to speak <laughs> after her, yeah. I'm gonna. She had her hand up next, and then we'll go to you. I'm just gonna say, no. Yeah, I'm holding you responsible. <laughs> we'll go here, yeah. here, and then to there, right there. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, Thanks. Thanks for doing this too. I think this is a great process and it really does involve the public, which is what I'm really glad to see the city taking on. And um, as a former architect and planning commission member, uh, there are a lot of elements of this that, that strike me that maybe would not strike other people. One of which is I don't know how you can lay out the site unless you know what the access is going to be. So the assumption here is that the access is through the single existing access point. In which case, I think you, I urge you to look at something called transit-oriented design, because otherwise we're just going to get a million cars going back and forth. And transit-oriented design does what someone in the back suggested about bringing in some of those basic amenities that people need on a day-to-day -day basis that they can walk to and get a, a, a quart of milk or something. Um, also, I would urge the team to not show any more plans that don't show the connection to the city. So where is the city in all of this? How far away is it on the plan? And so that we have a better concept of this isn't just a suburb out in, out in Netherlands somewhere. Um, I would urge you to cluster the housing, <coughs> create community spaces. That's what I really like about the mass, the uh, multifamily. That was, the way it was designed is they were designed around a central area. Um, no more cul-de-sacs. Uh, cul-de-sacs were a 1960s design element that is not the way we want to design now. We want to create connected communities. You connect communities with access points, not with end points. Um, and this is it. Thank you. <laughs> we go here and then to him in the back with purple. Can I ask people to identify themselves? Um, sure. Sorry. We could have been doing that. Uh, okay. I'm Ben Huffman, and I'm going to uh, take a slight, a somewhat different view than my friend Fawn, who is an outdoor recreationist. Um, this project presents Montpelier City Government with a unique situation and thereby opportunity. In my more than 50 years as both a Montpelier homeowner and as someone attentive to city affairs, this project is the first time I recall the city owning and directing the development of a major tract of land. The consultant's work has thus far produced valuable information on the site's physical condition. But at this point, I believe the planning focus should shift temporarily from questions of what specific uses should go where to broader questions of city development policy. That is, should the city accept an approach for this project typical of standalone suburban developments, or should the city use this project to articulate and demonstrate citywide policy more appropriate for meeting obvious 21st century challenges? Well, I believe the latter approach is needed which in brief would include as the project's primary goals, number one, to enhance Montpelier's downtown as the social and commercial heart of the city, rather than contribute to wasteful residential commercial sprawl and detract from the downtown's liability. <clears throat> Secondly, to eliminate rather than increase use of fossil fuels, particularly in transportation, and thirdly, to address rather than ignore that in all likelihood, Montpelier will continue to be an ever more attractive destination for, of climate migrants and others seeking a better place to live. So consistent with those goals, I want to make a few of the following suggestions. That the best use of the project site would be housing with recreational use ancillary to that. Secondly, that this housing should be as dense and plentiful as possible, yet not in high-rise buildings, but rather by taking inspiration from Montpelier's 19th century pattern of residential development, including use of hillsides. 
Also, the individual home ownership by all income levels, including units within multiple family structures, should be promoted, possibly through Habitat for Humanity and other financial supports of modest income owners. As the best way to foster social equity in housing and create stable and well-maintained neighborhoods. In addition, the street access to the project should be constructed in a physically most direct manner possible to downtown Montpelier, using the city's eminent domain authority where necessary, rather than depending on the street's current, the site's current access and add to the congestion of a longer route to River Street Corridor. Also, the public transit should be created with trip frequencies and personal convenience sufficient to achieve maximum reduction in automobile use. Finally, that a large-scale development such as I'm suggesting could benefit from economies of scale and potentially influence the housing supply-demand equation most favorably for individual buyers and renters. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Um, thank you again for the suggestion to identify yourself before you speak. Sorry, we didn't do that sooner. Um, so, um, there you are. Sorry. <laughs> so we'll, look at the wrong spot. we'll go here and then we'll go over here. <laughs> Uh, I'm Dan Kopic. I've uh, lived in Montpelier for seven years. I'm uh, a homeowner, but my most recent job, which I just left a couple weeks ago, was helping people with subsidies find apartments. Um, and whenever an apartment, first of all, there are maybe three that came up in the last year, uh, and when they, they that were at the affordable rate designated by HUD, and when they came up. Um, there were 75 applicants for every apartment. Um, uh, I also am a relatively new parent. I had a kid in 2020, right in the middle of lockdown. My brothers moved, my younger brothers moved closer and it took them over a year to find an apartment. Uh, and they eventually ended up moving in together um, at, uh, in a two bedroom. So I'm a bit of a housing maximalist for this site. However, I think the city um, really needs to consider having a stronger hand in developing uh, the housing here. The, um, the, just looking over the grand list for the past six years, the private sector has built a grand total of one building, one apartment building. Um, they've uh, developed, I think, 14 um, uh, retail and office apartments. Uh, or uh, apartments in formerly office or retail environments. And homeowners have outdone that building, I think 22 or something, ADUs, uh, accessory dwelling units in, in private homes. And the nonprofit sector has built something like 50. Um, so the, uh, so the, the, the excluding ADUs, nonprofit is out building the private sector two to one. Um, and I, I, I like, I want there to be housing here. I don't want <laughs> the, the uh, entities like the Boves or other corporate landlords to be controlling what is now public land. I, I think the city of Montpelier really should um, invigorate its public housing options. Uh, and that doesn't mean that people outside of the affordability can't use it um, uh, or that it would be just restricted to to those of lim limited means. Um, but I would advocate for uh, the city to, to um, uh, be realistic about what, um, what private entities might develop here. Thanks. Um, yeah, we'll go with the white mask and then the green hat. Hi, I'm Steve Cease. I'm a 40 year resident of Montpelier. I'm a one time Planning Commission member and then chair of the Montpelier Planning Commission. Um, I've had a deep interest in community issues for a long time. And I think this is a really interesting process and a good process. I just want to share a few thoughts about, I guess, 
a vision for what might happen out here. I think John Snell talked a minute ago about uh, creating a community out here, and I think one of the greatest examples of community you can see is right out this window. We've got maybe hundreds, I'm not sure how many kids are out there skiing right now, um, enjoying a terrific recreational opportunity. I think that's wonderful. That's a great example of community. And I think as we think about this property, let's remember that among its other aspects, it's kind of ironic. It's actually a great cross-country ski venue um, that I think uh, many of us recognize. So that really brings up the question of what do you do with this property? Certainly housing is an issue and a priority in this city. I think that with good imagination, good planning, and awareness of these opportunities, we can create a community out here of housing that also includes a continuing strong uh, dispersed recreation component, including skiing, running, dog walking, and so on. So that's my thought. I think we can be optimistic and imaginative, but we need to remember that here's a great example of community, and let's not lose that thought this summer when we're sitting here still working on this. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Here and then to um, me, Deborah. Yes, you. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Sandy. The only consideration that I would ask everybody to make is we're starting when we're thinking about what should we do with this property. We're starting from a point of we think that we need all these things, and I'd like everybody to consider what we already have. We already have a rec center that we've let fall completely apart. We already have a pool that you know isn't in great great condition right now. We already have a lot of things that we, that we as community members or the city haven't taken very good care of, quite honestly, and we haven't put any resources or money into those. So who's to say that you know 20 years down the road, we're not going to be in the same place with this community that we built. We're not going to put any more money into it other than this initial funding, and then it's going to fall apart. And so just consider what you already have. We have a lot of buildings downtown that could be used for some of these things that you say we need. We have a rec center, we have a pool, we have things that, we have streets that need work. We have a lot of things already. So consider that when you're talking about, oh, let's start all over and, and rebuild it here. Just just keep that in mind. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Deborah and then to you and then to you in the front. Yeah. Hi, I'm Deborah Messing. Uh, I would like to um, address the issue of the prime agricultural land uh, that kind of sparked my interest. I had been thinking about the concept of agrohoods, and I don't know if many of you know what they are, but um, if you just Google them, you could uh, find out. But it's basically a working farm embedded in a housing community. Um, there is one located in South Burlington, although that's a, um, that the homes there are pretty much um, upper end. But there are examples of uh, mixed income communities that have uh, embedded a working farm. So I'm talk about community, the idea of having a productive, well, you could call it an enhanced community garden, um, but using that uh, ag prime agricultural land to actually be uh, a serious producer of food for both the community and, uh, and the surrounding area as we approach a time of food insecurity. And also, for, face it, we're a community of people who are very interested in the quality of food, the co-ops down the street, etc. So I would put in a plug for that. Also, um, being 78, uh, I am interested in senior housing and would like to see um, that <clears throat> addressed possibly with part of uh, the housing part devoted to an assisted living uh, section. Uh, there seems to be, you know, people don't really want to admit that they're ever going to do this, but it um, uh, doesn't take much imagination. Uh, so I don't know what form that would take. Uh, I imagine maybe um, Heaton Woods would want to expand into with the their wonderful um, their, their their wonderful space and their wonderful staff maybe but they're kind of in a dump uh, maybe expand here uh, so that's one thing and another is um, oh and also making the, the the housing designs accessible for seniors with the triplexes maybe having them 
uh, some being on one floor, that kind of thing. Uh, but I know so many seniors who want to move into Montpelier, so many who want to live in a mixed generational uh, community and uh, rather than being just clustered among themselves. Okay, and lastly, um, the idea of um, housing for workers in our town. Uh, there is a community that has, could be a model for worker, for worker housing, and that's down in the White River Junction area. Uh, there's a group of businesses that were faced with, um, well, the same thing that every city is faced with these days is no housing for their workers that is affordable. So these businesses, including um, Hanover Co-op, are pooling funds, and then uh, those funds are being leveraged by Evernorth, which is a nonprofit, to build cooperative, or however you want to do it, but um, housing for workers that's affordable and uh, within walking distance or biking distance from their businesses. Thank you. Um, I'm creating your name. I'm sorry. You and then you, and then we'll go to the back. And we only have 10 minutes left, so I'm just giving a heads up. Uh, I'm Chris Hancock. Um, I like my failure. Um, and I'm just am concerned with some of these plans where they're living out here, whether people who live here will actually feel that that's where they live, or perhaps they live in, you know, I live off of Route 2, it might be more how they would describe uh, their residence. So I was really glad to hear the various people's voices that have said, let's work out more about the connecting roads so that if we're going to build a place for somewhere to live, let's actually expand our town as opposed to creating a satellite to it. I noticed in the, in the exercise that we had, and there was a westernmost area that didn't even get a letter because it's just too far from this access road. But what if, what if we were actually, there was access direct across to the town? If that happened, and I lived in this area, I'd rather live at the west end than at the east end. Um, so to me, one of the potential resolutions of this recreation versus uh, uh, housing is, let's have the recreation out here, which is so well suited to it, as people have pointed out, and let's have the housing closer to the town so people feel like they actually live in the town. Um, looking ahead, I, I also think, yeah, before we build some very conventional kind of neighborhood, Let's think a little bit bigger. Let's think about a little bit further in the future. I think uh, for this to feel more like part of the town, let's move the middle school out of here, for example. That's a miserable old building that they've been stuck in for decades. Um, and so my vote would be recreation over here, middle school, senior housing sounds great, and let's, live, let's let people reside closer to the town. Thank you. And then um, <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary Alice Bisbee, and I have to say, I am no longer a taxpayer. I live in subsidized housing. So um, I do know there is senior housing here, but a lot of us in senior housing live alone in an apartment, in a building where we have no connection with anybody else. And mainly it's because in, in my building, there are an awful lot of people that are younger, that are Washington County mental health patients, and my friends are all at the senior center. Um, and I did want to say we have a recreation building on Berry Street that I have never been in because I could not get in. And I want to know, I'm 86 years old. I uh, grew up in Washington County out on a dairy farm in Waitsfield. So I think I probably am the longest living person here. I don't know. There are probably some other Montpelier residents, too. And I went to Montpelier High School. Um, but co-housing is something I want to mention. Down in Burlington, they have a wonderful co-housing unit. And, and this is what I would like to live with people of various ages. I mean, I could help somebody with maybe some paperwork, but I can't help them with shoveling off my car, which I have to do myself. 
uh, you know, and in a place where I don't even have a garage. But co-housing, I think, is something that could be done through the nonprofit sector. It could be done with different uh, income levels, different age levels. You could have babies. You could have people like me holding the babies and, and keeping, you know, being daycare. It could be a, a really good thing to do. And I think we should look into what's happened down in Burlington with uh, the, the housing. Uh, it's near the medical center there. I've been to visit it. And, and I really would suggest that you go there because um, and, and think about it and think about some ways of getting nonprofit money to pay for it, too. That's it. Brown and then. With your hand raised in the back. Okay. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Noah Hornsby. I've lived in Montpelier for most of my three, four years. Um, I just want to say I've probably seen more of this property than you maybe. Um, I've typed almost every part of it and seen all the people's thoughts. And so it's, it's a really stunning property. Like, the city is so lucky to have this place. Um, I just wanted to encourage us to consider not making a dichotomy between housing and recreation as much as we try to perhaps are. Um, if we can integrate those two things as much as we possibly can, like, the lives of the people living here with the improve of people who come here and you know, have a lot of opportunities because there aren't places they can't go, there's housing. So just consider how to integrate those two things. Um, and also, the city, I think, should take an advantage of this opportunity to really sort of enforce what it wants out of this property over the coming you know, century. Like, okay, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Oh, I, I'm the sorry. city should take this opportunity to sort of enforce what you want this place to become over the next century. I mean, we're in a world that's heating up. And, you know, net zero would be great for all these buildings that get built here. Um, I like the suggestion about co-housing, I like the suggestion about like, the agricultural mix. Of, you know, let's think alternatives. Let's not just build another clone of a suburb that couldn't fit anywhere in the US. Like, let's make something that actually makes Montpelier stand out and is something that we can live with for the century plus. And then Brown and then Noah. So purple and then white mask. Just yeah. a, a quick comment, probably more for the city. If we're talking about really planning for the long term and making this a vibrant neighborhood, um, maybe this might be the time to think again about that merger with U32 since it's just a <laughs> history. I don't know how much closer it gets to go there. What'd you say? Uh, what's your name? Leslie. Leslie Allen. What'd you say? Oh, I said this might be. Um, a time to think about that merger with U32. Okay, white mask here, and then you in the back with blue coat. Um, hi, I'm Ari. I've lived in Montpelier six years, grew up in East Montpelier. Um, so yeah, just a couple of things. I think um, one thing to emphasize, the housing crisis is rough right now. Like, pretty much, um, yeah, like my landlord is thinking of selling the apartment, so I've like had my eyes on Craigslist, and it's like really depressing. All my friends are trying to like buy or rent. It's just like not a good scene. Um, so I think, yeah, it's really important to get more places so people can just like have. I mean, I just think we people should be able to take care of their basic needs to like have a roof over their head, and to um, and to like not have it be at the whims of like markets and things to like have some security and um, have to be affordable. Mm -hmm. So that's like one big point. I think also I want to echo what Dan was saying about um, developers and like landlords to try and like have it be intentional, be able to hold them accountable um, for the profit. Like they've got a big profit motive and we want, um, <coughs> we want to take care of people's needs. So, um, just whatever we can do to hold the profit incentivize people accountable to what we actually want for the place. Um, let's do that. Um, and just another thing, um, I think just thinking about community as a resource, um, because in my, like, I don't know, I'm of the generation where me and like people younger than me, even like some people older than me too, were like, what the heck is our future gonna be? Um, and I think like, you know, just all these overlapping crises and like having community and like being able to have like have this place set up in a way where like there's housing and infrastructure to like build relationships between people who live here. Um, some of, um, I don't remember your name, but um, 
some of your ideas were really great for that, like transit, just like places where people get to interact face to face. Um, so that, you know, like there's so much more resource sharing that goes on there. There's so much more it helps with mental health mm -hmm. to just like have people you're interacting with, um, acquaintances you can like borrow their blender, you know. Um, I think that just um, can help like with, I think thinking of community as something that concretely helps people with resources as well. So mm -hmm. thinking if we can build places so people have their needs met uh, in ways that keep profit-seeking uh, parties accountable and also in a way that fosters community with like design and other, other whatever else you can do. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go blue jacket in the back and then we can take one more and we're at time so um we'll go right here after go ahead i'm tim heaney um been here all my life I'm in this housing rental swirl that the last person just referred to every day i'm a real estate broker we own properties in montpelier i've been intimately involved in creating some of the last streets that were built in montpelier neighborhoods that were created so I'm very familiar with it i have decided to run for city council and uh, working on a petition for that this weekend because I want to be part of this conversation. And listening to all the ideas here today is really fascinating because we have a really good detailed zoning code in place that was created with a lot of public input over a long period of time that Barbara was part of and Steve. And those rules are all in the books. And a lot of your ideas are accommodated within that zoning, and so are. Um, but those are the overarching rules that we have to work with. And I think we've got a great framework there that will help guide us as the process evolves. And it's, it's kind of fascinating because I think what's going to happen, I'm really surprised with this project we haven't done a feasibility study up front. Um, I think Barbara's mention of like the road and access and what it allows, you know, the concept of putting a street going west and, and what that involves. It, there's a lot to it. It's possible it should be looked at. But that feasibility should be done. We should look at water and sewer lines, communications lines. What's it going to take to get those pieces to this site will help define what we really can do with it. Because if you're talking dense housing, but you really don't know how many units you can handle up here yet, um, that whole engineering piece up front really drives the train. It needs to be known before all these other plans can be integrated. So um, I'd love to see us do a little more front end work. This is a great process. and. But, but I think it'd be nice to have some data to help drive it. Hi. Hi, I'm Michael Sherman. Um, and when I got to look at the maps, the first thing that I saw was we have, those maps show three segregated communities, three ghettos, basically. And I think that if we have this opportunity, to build a community, as many of you have talked about, and really create a community within a community, we should forget about that only all the triplexes here, only the single families over here, only the apartment buildings over there. That does not build community. I was on the development review board and I saw a bunch of opportunities for housing that were turned down because the neighbors would say, oh, there goes the neighborhood. Just think back about your own life. I have been a renter, I have been a small homeowner, I'm now a retired single person who has a big home because can't afford to move any place where I lose money by selling a house which worth more and I and still have to and go to a place that's less room. Let's really think about this as John and others of you talked about as building a community and the, the first place is to mix it up. With the late Richard Hathaway used to, to make the, the kind of mercy or the comparison about the American myth as the, the, the uh, melting pot. Really, it's a salad bowl. <laughs> and I think we have to preserve the idea of a salad bowl, that there's lots of places for lots of people, and they can be next to each other without, oh, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> we just got one more here, and then we'll... Uh, uh, well, first of all, I agree with all of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Zach Watson. I'm with uh, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity. I also live in Montpelier, and, and really a lot of great comments. And um, but two other things that hadn't been mentioned. One is uh, that really want to be intentional. That this is a mixed 
income community. Uh, we, uh, Habitat for Humanity, would not encourage having any grouping of just low-income families by themselves or just affordable housing. It really, uh, it's a community that lifts itself up when there's all different ranges. So really encourage mixed income. Uh, the other piece is, um, you know, we're so close to Berlin. Uh, it's right there. I don't know if there's anybody here from Berlin or Barrie, um, but, you know, we are, uh, I shop in Berlin. I go to Ber uh, Barrie all the time, Pearl Street Pizza, great. Um, and I know there's a lot of folks from Barrie and Berlin that come here too. And it'd be really interesting to see how, um, what the other communities are thinking about and how this uh, is an opportunity to connect us. Um, I think public transportation, it really only works if we're also working with Berlin. Uh, the folks here are going to want to go to Berlin, so how do we work on those things? So I, I, I would encourage the city to work with uh, Dr. Berlin and Barry and see how uh, they can support this community as well. Uh, Central Vermont Medical Center is the second largest employer in, in our area besides the state, uh, and they are in Berlin. Uh, and so they will probably be the largest beneficiary of this project, and so they should be involved in the process, which they probably are. Thank you. Thank you. Your name? Uh, I'm Zach Watson. I'm with, uh, yeah. Thanks, Zach. All right. Um, well, to be respectful of everyone's time, we did say we would um, stop at noon. Uh, again, please share the word to get out to the other uh, opportunities, whether it's a meeting or the survey. We really appreciate the input, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much.